I'm Rob Thompson. I've been involved in uh, commercial aviation for 20 years. Um, also a UAV consultant and analyst. I've uh, done military projects and civilian stuff. Um, like to introduce uh, Walter Volkman of Micro Aerial Projects, and this topic is on um, mapping capabilities. So thanks uh, for giving me an opportunity here to give you a perspective from a, a, a grassroots, uh, grounded kind of a user of, of UAV technology for quite a while now. So, uh, you know, I started a little company called Micro Aerial Projects way back in 2008. It is for profit, mainly making losses to date, um, <laughs> because of the banning of this activity for so many years. Um, how do I go? How do I go to the next slide? Okay, so I could show you lots of stuff that we've done in the past. My, our main experience is gained overseas because we couldn't do it here. So as a as a consultant in cadastral surveying, I had the opportunity to see the world all over the show, especially in the developing scenario, and. Um, uh, I, I see drones um, as, as a means to democratize and empower small enterprises. It's not so much just the democratization that's interesting, it's also the empowerment. So drones having become small, light, easy to operate, affordable, very important, transportable, ask those guys who've stood in front of uh, customs officials, um, field repairable, very, very important, and automatable. Those are the elements that make drones in the developing environment sustainable. If you don't have those characteristics in the technology, you can forget a uh, sustainable um, operation of or use of drones in the uh, developing environment. So who are going to be the operators? Hopefully they'll be individuals and small enterprises because they are geographically or spatially more disseminated than big companies and large enterprises like government departments. Um, who, are you, who are the people using drones today? It's from the enthusiast to the professional. So how do we cater, how do we cope with all of that um, without giving this technology, technology a chance to produce the experience? If we squash it right away, we don't harvest any experiences or any data on which to base decent regulations, rational, and reasonable regulations. Oops. So Chris Anderson, I don't know whether you know of him, author of a book called um, The Long Curve, on which I've based my business model, um, uh, says the, uh, the drones bring democratization of the aerial view. And the aerial view is a very, very interesting and valuable perspective for occupiers of the land. But parallel to that, and very important specifically to surveyors, is the emergence of a process called structure from motion, which allows you to use off-the-shelf camera technology to build highly accurate geospatial products. Without that, the drone business would not nearly be as exciting to the geospatial industry as it is today. And it is highly automated. So in this little workflow chart that you see here, the only manual interaction that requires some kind of a geospatial background is the introduction of ground control if you want to have highly pre uh, very precisely georeferenced data. The, if you don't want that, if you don't need that, it is highly, highly automatable and basically uh, an easy uh, technology transform, uh, transfer from uh, the manufacturing and the configuration point to the end user. So here's, for example, uh, how easily without you having any interaction, having any personal input, you can restructure an environment to build a very highly, highly realistic uh, uh, virtual world of of, of, for example, a village in Africa. So structure from motion, uh, the structure from motion method empowers individuals and small enterprises to take over the whole mapping process from A to Z 
but in small bits and incrementally. So this opens up many, many new opportunities to engage or to use geospatial products. You can produce them as and when needed, be much more responsive to demand than you could be with the conventional way of getting maps out of a centralized, highly centralized uh, uh, enterprise. And the other important thing for those who are in the geospatial business, the accuracy is always the big measure of reliability and all of these things. Accuracy is, with this kind of high resolution imagery that we collect, is virtually a byproduct of what we do. It doesn't depend on the qualifications of the individuals anymore who are making the maps as to whether the map is accurate or not. The technology takes care of that by itself. So this is another barrier that we can now remove from the mapping environment. And the other thing I would like to just, because time is so limited, throw in here is we don't always need to produce a map. Often a picture speaks a thousand words. Unless you really have a need to quantify something, if you want to just make an absolute point, you can just take a photograph of it. And you can annotate that photograph. And if you've done your flight planning correctly and so on, if ever a need arises in the future to do the mapping, which is the major effort in, in uh, UAV produced uh, geospatial uh, products, um, then you can do so and use these annotations that you made Say, for example, at the moment of adjudication in a village where there's a first, first property registration going on. So this mapping, while very, very nice to have, is not essential as far as uh, appropriate application of drones in the developing world is concerned, and even in the first world. I think that's all I'd like to take your time on. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Walter. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Nina and Georgie Tusev of Tusev Aerials. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're really happy to be here. We'll just introduce ourselves. Oh, Mike, sorry. Um, hope you can hear me better. We'll introduce ourselves, and then we'll show you an example of the work that we're doing right now. So my name is Nina Tusev. And um, with uh, Georgie, my husband, we started this project called Two Shift Serials. Um, he will tell you, but he's been um, working out in the FPV movement for many, many years. And um, I come more from an environmental activist background. I've worked um, at different nonprofit organizations and the United Nations, mostly with indigenous peoples. And so when um, I learned about his hobby, I, I, we realized how powerful of a tool this is for communities and for them to be able to protect their their land and their territories, which obviously are fa facing huge pressures. Um, and I work in the deforestation uh, protection of rainforest fields. So um, this is a really powerful tool. And uh, thanks to a very innovative and, and forward thinking donor here, uh, we were able to pilot this in, in, uh, in some countries. And um, a very popular country today, Peru, is uh, well, <laughs> some, apparently it's <laughs> where a lot of drone pilot uh, testing takes place. So we'll show you our experience from last summer and uh, what we did there, training communities um, to use drones and, and turning the technology over to them. But introduce well, you, Hello, everyone. Uh, you introduced me already, so I'll just well, <laughs> this is say hi. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm from a background of uh, hobbyist and um, also a visual artist. I don't know how that's relevant, but somehow uh, processing images uh, makes sense. And uh, building, and, and building uh, actually stuff made of real materials uh, and um, uh, foam glue <laughs> and uh, adding uh, on top of that uh, awareness of some sort, uh, flying control, making work in a real world. That makes me excited and uh, collecting also images and putting them together into some kind of sense. Like maps, uh, yeah. 
So the video you'll see is an example of um, the training that we carried out in the northern part of uh, Peru in the Loreto region. Um, and there was a collection of um, four different indigenous peoples, tribes, from three from Peru and one from Panama that gathered together to learn how to use the technology. And um, Georgie built a, a drone a flying uh, it was a, a very traditional kind of a Skywalker type of platform that was outfitted uh, fully for first person view and also to capture high resolution images, obviously, with the goal of making maps and videos later. Um, and the goal was to train the communities to be able to use the drone and then turn it over to them so that it's in their hands to use uh, for their own advocacy. And we were also in an area that had a lot of oil pipes and there had been oil spills. So that was something that we got to monitor as well in the process of the training. So you'll see in the video. In nine days. Yeah. It took nine days. Um, how do we? John will. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, square of the community is San Jose de Soramur. back and forth about uh, uh, 50, 20 miles, yeah? yeah? So we have to cross the river and approach. It's not pipe serving. It's, uh, we just follow the pipe line because that's the way that only we can find out to, to reach to the epicenter of the oil spill. And this is, as you can see, this is a map made up of uh, 30 different images, just the yeah. stitch, yeah. Stitched uh, images. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. 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 This is a traditional Amazon uh, song as well. <laughs> <laughs> So with this data, um, the host organization, which is the National Indigenous Peoples Organization of the Amazon Indigenous Peoples, w was able to monitor what the deforestation looks like along the line, what the health of the, uh, whether the oil pipe is positioned correctly. I mean, there's a number of environmental um, indicators that the oil company needs to comply with. So in a matter of this flight, which took 30 minutes, just under 30 minutes, uh, they were able to collect data that is really otherwise very expensive or timely or quite impossible to gather in any other way. Okay, so um, we'll um, stop the video here. It's, it's online if anybody wants to see it, but in order to have time for discussion, thanks for your attention. We'll be back. And this is the spill. Oh, that's the actual spill there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. I'd like to uh, have Matthew Lippincott, uh, co-founder of Public Labs, speak next. I, thank you for having me here. It's really wonderful to be uh, in this community and uh, on the same stage with such wonderful uh, developers and people who are into flight. Um, I personally have been into flight since I was about four and started making paper airplanes. Um, and have engaged starting as a, as a hobbyist and now working with Public Lab. Um, you know, I came into this as a volunteer initiative out of our grassroots mapping uh, program. I was one of the people on the mailing list uh, who hand makes balloons for fun and, uh, and kites. And so I was sending advice. And if anyone wants, you should ask Shannon about some weird boxes I'd mailed her during the oil spill. Um, and I'd like to, I don't have any, any slides, but I'd like to uh, talk about two practicalities in mapping. One, because we fly kites and balloons, I think I need to make an impassioned defense of what would be in the jargon called a tethered UAS. Um, many people, when they hear that we fly kites and balloons, and they say, oh, that's really, that's really nice, but aren't drones going to replace those? And um, I really don't think that will be the case. Uh, Washington, D.C. is currently, uh, its airspace is uh, monitored by a uh, captive balloon that is in Maryland, uh, a Lockheed Martin uh, tethered blimp. Um, and there are many cases in which it's very useful to have a tether. Um, it, things can't fly away. If they have a tether, you can get it back. And it simplifies a lot of your flight 
and uh, um, uh, flight technologies and can actually provide some data security in that you're not necessarily using a wireless link. Um, for people who are looking to provide internet, you know, you don't necessarily want internet to move once you've set it up, so having a tethered thing in one place is also very useful. Um, and simplifying your flight technology allows a lot of community ownership of that technology. Um, kites are something that can be built and maintained by almost anyone. I personally have a mapping rig that's contributed data to Google Maps, uh, where the camera, the kite, and the string, uh, in fact, the entire workflow is, is less than $50. So, you know, those are things you should think about in your projects. That, that there are cases where these are still very useful technologies. Um, the other practicality I would like to talk about is um, where we're going in terms of um, data and storing data. And there, there are some wonderful folks here in the room from the Open Aerial Map program. Um, and we've been working with them. As Shannon had mentioned, our software Map Knitter is for uh, manual map stitching. And um, we've also been working with uh, Stephen Mather, who's not here at the Open Drone Map program. And, and, and together, we're articulating a concept about how we're using and storing aerial imagery moving forward where we're, not, we're no longer relying on professional credibility as our only uh, track record of the quality of imagery. You know, we now need to re we're now going to have millions of people contributing aerial imagery into a system. And so the question arises, what does our workflow look like? And what does our storage look like? And what does data verification look like? Um, in the future. And um, the way we see it, Open Aerial Map will be the, um, the repository that we're all going to be sharing of open, publicly available imagery. And how we're going to get that imagery there and then verify that imagery, you know, we're going to use structure from motion to process imagery, but we also need to store those original photos. And so, you know, I would I would say that we all need to think about what's that, what's that process going to look like? And we, we at Public Lab would like think that, and, and a lot of the people at the Open Aerial Map, I believe, would agree with us, that we should save those individual photos, present those individual photos, and, and have a full record from the original data collection mission to the processed aerial imagery available in the public, uh, in the public record. Um, and that will prevent some of the issues we're facing with constant surveying around um, uh, drift, you know, of one survey being built on another survey, being built on another survey, until you can have an object, you know, the, ac the accuracy, the precision of the survey is very good, but you're going to have drift from an accurate position in the global, um, in GPS positions. And so by saving original imagery, by saving original surveys, it provides the kind of record that we're going to need going forward in order to, uh, to verify um, all those systems. So, anyway, thank you. I'd like to invite my panel to come up, take a seat. Well, since we're uh, limited on time, I'm only going to pose one question to the panel, and then I'm going to turn it over to you guys. The question I have We'll wait till everyone gets mic'd up here. The question I have is, uh, you know, who owns this data that you guys are collecting? And uh, after it's collected, you know, the public access, should there be any limitations to the people that can access this stuff? And uh, just like start off with Walter. Yeah, I, I think um, there's this concept of metadata. You know, if I was the, uh, the king of the country uh, about five, six years ago, I would have said, you can all fly. But you have to file your flight plans uh, to a central database. And so that those people who are now engineering all the legislative processes that, that legitimize uh, drone use can actually have data to build, um, to ha have a statistical kind of a base to build regulations on. That would, that would be my kind of thing. Um, supply the metadata, make the public aware of the existence of the data, and then negotiate the access maybe later. But don't hold everything back now just because you haven't clarified the legislative framework um, 
in mapping by drones. Sure. And uh, Matthew, what's your take on this? What? Uh, who owns the data? Well, it depends on what data you're collecting. I would say you should always try to situate data collection within a decision-making process. We don't, and so that the people who are collecting data about their own environment have a sense of what that data is going to be used for, and so that limitations can be placed on that collection around community concerns. Um, and I would, I would argue against a policy of always making data public um, and say that, that communities should have some sort of pre-release uh, review of data before it gets, it, it gets put out uh, generally. Thank you very much. And uh, Nina? Um, in our case, it's a, it's, it's a complicated issue, but it's one that's very important um, because um, in our case, this kind of data can be used by communities for their own advocacy, obviously, um, to map their territories and to seek um, remedies from the companies that possibly are not following the environmental compliance. Um, so when we do the training, we agree with the community. Obviously, the data is theirs. Um, especially once we leave there and the drone becomes their own. Um, th their own. So um, we usually ha can share it with them uh, while we're there for the purposes of, of assisting with making maps or other, uh, in other ways, processing the data, but it is for the communities. Excellent. And uh, I'd like to begin taking some questions from the crowd, if we have our microphone person here. Anywhere? Sure, if you could please speak loudly and introduce yourself. Uh, my name is John Parsons from Noble UAS. I have a question about your viewpoint on data. John, you can grab the mic. Uh, Hi, John Parsons, Noble UAS. I have a question about your viewpoint about data not being uh, for the public. Is that driven off of uh, a royalty concern? Say a community does a project, they invest the time and the effort their royalties become pr protected? Is that the main thing that's driving your viewpoint? No, uh, no, not at all. <laughs> so I'm sorry to be really quick about it. Um, but I would say it's more about what that data could be used for. Um, in one example, I, I think about a uh, housing and uh, HUD grant that was given in Butte, Montana, a community that I'd worked in. People were looking at the distribution of that money, and it was for um, it's for neighborhood beautification, essentially. And that brought up some interesting issues for people because whose house needed to be painted was a reflection of who had money to paint their house. And people didn't necessarily want a public record of who was the poorest person in their community who couldn't maintain their house. You know? So people wanted to actually just have town hall meetings that were about the community and figuring out how to distribute that money. Now, for Accountability's sake, there needed to be some sort of record. So there are public records, but they were kept on paper, they're kept in the town hall, and they, don't be, they didn't become a part of uh, a published data, you know, saying so-and-so's you know, too poor to maintain their facade, so we had to subsidize the, you know, repairing their facade, because those were, those were concerns. People didn't want to uh, shame their neighbors in that case. And that's just, I think there are a lot of cases like that, and then of course there are cases where the stakes are much higher on how that data could be used. Um, yes, I can relate that also to agriculture. There's um, very competitiveness between farmers about who's doing actually well and who's collecting their insurance because of uh, damaged crops. Walter? Yeah, I know of a real life case where a government actually abused the, the high resolution aerial photography that was delivered in line with a, of, a, of a development project funded by the World Bank. Uh, or the USAID, I don't know really uh, exactly who it was, but uh, a, a light-wing, uh, ultralight aircraft was used to collect high-resolution photographs of a coastal area that needed some environmental management attention. And in the process of that, uh, imagery was made available to the government, which then used this imagery to identify who was transgressing on building regulations and out came the bulldozers. So it was a real big deal. You know, the government actually bulldozed buildings that contravened uh, uh, building regulations. Uh, next question, please. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask a, go ahead, Tim. Um, 
So, you know, there, there's a lot of great, uh, very expensive tools like PIX4D, and I'd love to hear uh, about how you think the evolution of free or much less expensive tools are going. And you talked about sort of Map Knitter, uh, Map Mill, w which are awesome but very labor intensive. You know, are we going to get PIX4D like things, uh, you know, in the near to uh, immediate, medium term future that you know, provide that level of capability for a much more accessible price? Absolutely. Uh, the Open Drone Map Project is, a, is an open source structure for motion package that you can use today to create georeference point clouds. Um, it is still in early development. You know, you're going to have to set up a computer pretty much just for it. Um, but it works. And where we see that going is, you know, we've focused on this manual stitching, something that's very easy to use and very easy to teach. In many ways, we've developed some competence with MapKnitter and MapMill around what the interface should be for individual aerial photos. Then Open Drone Map and the Structure for Motion, is kind of, those are packages that are dealing with how we're going to process that imagery. And then Open Aerial, open aerial Map would be you know, how we're going to package and share and normalize that, that data and access it. So you know, we're looking at integrating those workflows um, you know, we would like to see our, our aerial image software and MapKnitter become a, an interface for dealing with and handling and processing and storing uh, the images themselves and, you know, server-side software like Open Drone Map being able to, you know, process and, and serve you a point cloud or process data and, um, and then integrate that into Open Aerial Map so that, you know, we have uh, public access satellite data just like, like Google Maps. For the sake of time, I'm going to ask the last question. And uh, if you guys could give me a 30-second, 60-second answer. I would like to uh, know where, where's the future in data mapping and the future uses for localized data collection, interpretation, and implementing this data? The future is in uh, some concerted effort from the development community to uh, drive the initiative to decentralize these mapping capacities. I think that's the future. Without that sort of dissemination, uh, this mapping technology will remain very much in the hands of the few and will, be, will remain a foreign input rather than a domestic local kind of a contribution to development. Thank you. I think uh, the future could head two directions. We could have a backlash against uh, public collection of imagery or um, a massive expansion of public collection of, uh, of map imagery. Um, I think it's going to depend exactly on how accessible the technology is and uh, how we situate it within um, uh, participatory and, and decision-making processes. Um, if it's seen as a tool of the powerful, against, uh, you know, tool of the few against the many, then it's going, there's going to be a backlash. And if it's seen as a tool for everybody, I, I think we're, we're going to see a, a more subtle conversation. Thank you very much. Two shows? Uh, I personally think that uh, putting together the fact that uh, technology become uh, cheaper and cheaper with every day, more and more affordable and smaller and lighter and, um, um, and smarter, <laughs> uh, I, I see probably exponential um, uh, distribution of this data and mm, probably becoming instantaneous over the net over time, like more and more instantaneous availability of the data. Th thank you very much. And uh, my one soapbox thing is uh, we all need to pull together and educate everyone and, uh, and quit the infighting amongst our industry. Thank you very much.